this time on Graveyard Cars. Mark and the Ghouls fight to finish the one-of-a-kind Go Mango Tribute 1970 Red Eye Challenger before the SEMA deadline kills their convention dreams. But will shop shenanigans? Maybe a dino nugget burrito with tater tots, man. Car customizations and the mounting modifications needed to keep this massive 6.2 liter 807 horsepower supercharged V8 Hemi in place trip up the team before they reach the finish line. Find out on this episode of Graveyard Cars. All right, so today's an exciting day just because this is the last paintwork we have to do on our SEMA build for this year. And is what it entails is we're painting the spoiler, the flat black, we are painting the hood flat black, and the deck lid. So right along the bottom of this, Tony was nice enough to send us references of an original Panther Pink TA that he had pictures of. So we'll go through the process, measure the same measurements that we have here, which from the end of the deck lid to where it's supposed to stop, is about an inch and five eighths. We'll measure that out on each side, mask it off, and then we'll start the flat black process. Then after that, we'll walk away, kick it over to assembly. They can finish putting this car together. So it's interesting how they did the bumblebee stripe when they painted them on. They actually laid the color down of the bumblebee stripe. So let's say you had an FC7 Plum Crazy Purple Challenger and it was coated for the black bumblebee stripe. The way the factory would do it is they would paint black on the deck lid in the quarters, probably halfway up to the back glass, way past where the bumblebee stripe would go. Then they come back, mask that black off and paint the actual car itself. Now that's the way the factory did it, but of course Will has a better idea. We'll do it his way because he knows more than Walter Chrysler apparently. So back in the day, the blackout was done with a the lacquer. They don't make that anymore. It's very hard to come by. So you have to kind of just cocktail your own stuff to replicate it. The good thing about this is over time, lacquer would just kind of wash off with time. With what we do, it's gonna last just as long as the car. So it's not quite exact, but it is pretty close. Are you gonna put on? Yes. Watch your mouth. <laughs> Careful. So one of the last things we had to do was get the hood fit. We weren't really concerned because it's a TA hood. So it's got a good three or four inches extra of clearance where a regular hood would not. With this car particularly, we did a lot of modifications, pre-fitting stuff. It wasn't just, hey, here's a Challenger, let's put it together. So much time and detail went into this car. Josh just went above and beyond making sure that when it came time to assemble the car, it went together perfectly. It was like this car was meant to go together the way that we did it. The hood fit perfect, clearance was not an issue, and this car was just was made to go the way we did it. All right, lift up a lot. The Trans Am Challenger is the sister to the AAR Cuda. One of the cool things is this cold air induction hood in 94, if you have an A or a TA Challenger, is fiberglass, is completely fiberglass. So because it's fiberglass, it doesn't have the weight and it doesn't have the strength that you'd see in a metal hood. So what they did was they put a smaller diameter hood spring on them. So they open and close properly. So if you were to show, look at the diameter of that hood spring, it should be pretty small, almost looks like a washing machine size of spring versus the original ones that you see on any of these cars about half again as big around diameter we should have marked this holes yeah
Yeah, I need to go back quite a bit. Jumps. How's your side, Josh? Mine's looking pretty good so Pretty far. good, okay. We're overlapped here. Yeah, I need to go back about a quarter of an inch. Yeah, probably half an inch. It's just a little crooked. So Justin's gonna adjust his side just a little bit. Then the front of the hood will come over this way and then we should be good. So when we do the pre-fit before the paint, it gives us a chance to get all those adjustments made. And then that final time going on, it just goes on like it was supposed to. Yeah, looks really good. All right, let's get the rest of the pieces on it. All right. So I've been planning this for a while. Halloween's coming up and I wanted to be something kind of scary or super scary at this point. I gathered some materials together, found some clothes in the dumpster, hit the Halloween spirit store, basically put together this look. You see it on the streets a lot sometimes. Found some socks and some shoes, trying to go for that retro look, you know? Basically try to look as bummy as possible but I ended up looking like Will. That's how it kind of went from there, and I thought that was pretty scary. That was a great Halloween costume for sure. Hey, if I asked you to paint something, will you do it now or will you do it two months from now? Uh, uh, probably maybe a year, something like that, you know? Yeah. I'll figure it out. My Instagram's kind of full right now, so <laughs> I'll have to. I think Count Dracula did a great job, or Anthony, whatever his name is, doing his impersonation of Will. He had the mannerisms down, that lazy, miserable cretin type of thing, walking around with the hair down. Like, I don't care, right? He had the I, I give up look. Perfectly. Looked like he slept in his clothes. He uh, he did a fantastic job. It was a great surprise, too, to see that, because he's the only one here that dressed up for Halloween. We were all panicking pretty much because we had to get ready to go uh, down to the show. But I think he did a fantastic job. The only thing I'd like to point out right here is uh, just not to forget this, there there really is only room for one actual entertainer. No kidding. Barely there. See it? Uh, Do you want to die, Dougie? Oh, <laughs> what the? Boo! <laughs> Jerry Seinfeld, Steve Martin, right? Mark Warman. Hey, if you need me, I'll be on my phone. I kind of feel bad, but... No, I'm really I'm good at the same time, you know? <laughs> I thought it was a good idea. Hey, like, where's your replacement at? He's, he's better. better. Hey, hey, replacement Will? No, it's 2.0 it's Will. Is it PC Will? PC. Oh no, he's way worse. <laughs> Down? Way worse. Down? So I had an opportunity to drive the car right before we loaded it up for semen. It was a very short opportunity. It was like, I think I had five minutes, maybe 10. It's, so there's not a lot of driving footage. Apologize for that, that is what it is. The car is a very complete package. I mean, it sounded beautiful. TTI exhaust, it had the Magnum Force front suspension, had the hill crate in it. The It had a five-speed. We ended up going with an American powertrain five-speed in this one, so we didn't have to modify the floor nearly as much as we have to when we do the six-speed. So very sanitary installation from one end to the other. You know, the PPG paint, everything, all of the parts that are on this car made this car come to life. That's the great news. Beautiful car, unbelievable, never seen anything like it. Bad news is if you even look at the gas pedal the wrong way, you're sideways in that car. It's 807 horsepower in a 3,550 pound car. It's 3,550 now with that engine in it. It is absolute death trap. Like, like Springsteen, it's a death trap. It's a suicide rap. Get out while you're young, man. I don't understand that song anyway. Why would you want to get out while you're young? Get out when you're old, right? 
Live fast and die old. Don't live fast and die young. That's stupid. We got a great team here at the shop, and these guys were new a year or two ago, but now being more kind of experienced and being veterans at the shop, when it comes to a SEMA build, they know what goes into it. They know that, A, they got to build this car, also maintain working our regular job, getting the other cars done. But what Josh did, his planning, the thought process that went into it, and the fact that it went together exactly the way he saw it in his head, was actually just a huge saving grace to the shop. So I'm a metal guy by trade and passion, but I'm also a team player. It's really interesting being part of the assembly process of this Challenger and being able to do a couple modifications on that in the process. It's out of my norm, but it was also a fun change up in pace. The car came out absolutely amazing. I'm super happy with how it came out. Uh, it's pretty much perfect. With the Hellcat Red Eye T8 Challenger now complete, and our world-famous Phoenix Cuda also invited on this flight to SEMA. The ghouls get the cars in the truck and on the road for the nonstop haul to Las Vegas. So I got to the show around noon on Monday, and it doesn't open, the show doesn't open until Tuesday. So it gave me an opportunity to get around, see where everybody was at, all the different vendors that I wanted to see. I actually had time this time. I don't usually end up with a lot of time, but uh, I was able to stop by and visit a lot of the different booths. I, I like to keep up with some of the stuff that we have right now, even though it's five years old, it's fairly new, but they probably updated it. So when you go into these booths and you think you've got the state-of-the-art paint gun or the state-of-the-art air system or whatever it is, they've upgraded it and there's something new out there. So it's fantastic because I'm still a shop owner. I may be on TV, we may be doing all this stuff, but I'm a shop owner. So I'm always looking to see what kind of equipment is out there, what's the newest equipment that's out there, what can we buy that we could put into our shop that would help us produce a car faster and better than we did the one before it. So for me, it is a bit of a playground down there to walk around and see all the vendors. So when you're walking around the show at SEMA, and you know, like in our little world here, we're the Kingfish. We just finished amazing cars, but we're the only real game in town. You get out to SEMA and you're up against the best in the world, truly the best in the world. It, it is a very humbling experience. There are car builders there that can make us look bad. I mean, literally, they because they'll handcraft everything. Like Foose just had a really cool car in his booth there. I can't even remember what it is. I don't want to disrespect it by not saying it, but all handcrafted aluminum, all buffed aluminum, all, or not buffed, but it was uh, it was grained. It, it, it looked exactly like a factory car, but it was all built from scratch. You go to the other booths, and there's just wild stuff there that we couldn't, couldn't even imagine, let alone build. So again, I say that the SEMA show for me is about the cars first, I think that's the most important thing. And then relationships with people, relationships with our vendors, and getting to see people you haven't seen in a long time. At the heart of Graveyard Cars, we're about the people and we're about the cars, and those are what really matter to me. See, that's exactly what I was saying. It's not about the cars, it's just about the chicks. It has nothing to do with the cars. He wouldn't spend three hours looking at cars. No, we're there freaking in line waiting to get a picture with this chick. And then after we turn around and leave and I finally get him away from harassing the poor girl, he turns around and asks me, do you think she likes me? So the best way to describe market SEMA with the models, I don't know if he doesn't get, these models are paid just to be there to take those pictures and that's it. And half the time, the girl's younger than me. She's like 20, maybe. Look, I wasn't there to chaperone, and this is what happens. You know, I'm just gonna ask the models myself next time we go down there and just put a button on this whole thing. They'll probably give a fake response just to make them happy. Dad, get real. These are models. They get paid to flirt. They don't like you, okay? I mean, picture this. You're in Las Vegas, and you have a full camera crew following you around. Of course, they're gonna be interested in what you're doing. Then at the end, he goes, oh man, it would've been really nice if I could walk around and see one and see the cars. Maybe if I wasn't just such a big celebrity and everybody knew who I was. In his simple mind, he really believes that they're there to take pictures with him. Seriously, that's what he thinks. 
Okay, I admit it, I'm human, all right? I like to have a little bit of fun. Everybody likes to have a little bit of fun. What's wrong with that, okay? Well, the cat is away, the mouse shall play. And I'm a big believer in what the cat doesn't know, you know? What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> oh, just wait till I tell my mom. We'll see how funny it is when my mom finds out. It's all fun and games till mom finds out. She's crazy. She didn't watch the show anyway. So it's a win for me, right? <laughs> Put one in the W column. <laughs> I see you've been a busy boy. No. Yeah. We're going to talk about it. OK. I don't even know why you'd even end up with something like that, because that doesn't make any sense. Huh. Makes lots of sense to me. But. Mark invited me and my wife to go along with him. And, you know, it, it was it's a really big deal for me. Mark doesn't always do that. Uh, but having the honor of being able to go, being able to see all these absolutely insane builds, you know, that was, is really humbling. We do a lot of OE restoration type stuff, but being able to see the craftsmanship and the amazing skills of other people about the custom stuff that they build, it's really exciting and it, it really drives me to do better even. The car, like I said, was just went seamless. It was such a great quality build. I'm very proud to be part of that car. Um, so to have that car there representing, you know, the old school 70s with the modern drivetrains, awesome. This particular year was, was really special because Heather and Layla came down. We're not just building these cars like we used to as far as you build a car, it goes to the customer, they're happy. You're building a car for the, one of the biggest car shows in the world for everyone to see. It's like next level type builds. And Heather and Layla are there. And Layla's not going to remember it. But when she goes back and watch, she's going to be like, God, that was really cool. I, I, I got to be part of what my dad does. At the Mopar booth every year, we usually have space for one of our cars. And for us to have two cars on their display floor with the best in the world and the newest products that are coming out, just a real honor to, to be part of that this year. We know. When did you get out of prison, buddy? An hour ago. An hour ago. <laughs> One little thing there's a photo of is myself and the team with the Mopar team that I'm used to seeing every year. And there was one gal missing, Bernie, who we love you, Bernie. Sorry. She's not with the, uh, the team anymore. But we wanted to put a little sign because we wanted her to feel like she's still part of the family, even though she couldn't be there. So there's my little love call out to Bernie because she's she absolutely was the, the genesis of all of this for us when it came to getting parts. She was the person that made that happen all the way back to 2016 when we first started going to the show. So I thought SEMA was dope. I thought it was really cool, it was a blast. And it went by in a flash, everything was so quick. This may have been our best showing at SEMA yet, uh, in my opinion. I've been there for three years, and this was by far the, the best one that we've done. We had two cars there, which, which was cool. Uh, we usually just bring one car, but having two brought even more attention to us in and, and the Mopar booth. Mark wants me to talk about how I had fun filming. He, he clearly hasn't filmed before, it's not the funnest thing. Uh, you're trying to stay focused. I'm pretty sure I put my camera down 10 times because my back was hurting. It's growing on me. It's growing on me. I guess that's fun. It was cool seeing so many people support us, the show. There's hundreds of people there showing love to Graveyard Cars, to Mark, to Will and Justin. There's even some love for Tiny. It was cool seeing Wendell there. I saw Ron Jenkins there. It's always fun to see people that you know there. There's a lot of local support there too. A lot of people came from Junction City and Portland area to show us some love out there. All the fans were talking about how much they love the show and there was so much support there. There was long, long lines. Everybody wanted to get in line to get signatures from Mark and the guys. Yeah, a lot of people told me that GYC was like the main attraction there. We had the longest lines compared to other people and that was shocking to see. I tried to get in some really cool shots of the lines. They went on for miles. Just making some great TV. Yeah, number one show on the network. How are you 
No big deal. Came from my mind, the whole show, everything. Still to come. With the SEMA Challenger finally finished and at the big show, has the pressure of this year's build finally pushed Mark over the edge? And will the stress of finishing this first ever tribute 1970 Red Eye Challenger on time cause him to snap and lash out at his fans? Yeah. Find out when Graveyard Cars return. So there was a car outside of the convention center near where I stay. Uh, frankly, I can't remember if it's a 68, 9, or 70 because everything's shaved off of it. But I, I think it's a 69. Anyway, it's a beautiful charger. It is shaved all the way around, so that means no handles, no mirrors. They even shaved, like, the drip rails. What they tried to do was they tried to modernize today's cars. You'll see that on today's cars, you don't have big chrome drip rail moldings. You don't have big chrome moldings around the windshield. It's all encapsulated glass and it's just done differently. Because what they're trying to do is follow today's cars by having no reveal molding on the windshield, no drip rail moldings on it. He modified everything and it was so sanitary and the car was so straight. Then you open the inside, beautiful. He's had custom made sills that call out the Hellcat, custom dash, custom interior, it's beautiful. Under the hood, he's got a Hellcat in it, but it's sanitary. It's really, really sanitary. There's no extra pieces hanging around. Now, the way we do it is like as if you were to go into Chrysler in 1970 and order one, that's the engine you'd get. It looks the same, except for the engine. His is totally custom. And I'm not a big fan of the custom stuff, but I just thought he deserved to have a minute on TV. There's a lot of builders out there that do great work that never get the recognition because they don't have the platform we do. I just thought it'd be real solid to let everybody know that was a fantastic job. If I ever wanted to have a custom done, I'd take it to him. Now there's a lot of different stuff there. The, the custom cars like the Charger, they're all over the place, not quite to that caliber. I thought that was one of the best ones. But like the trucks, these things are fantastic looking. They're works of art. Somebody has just bled over these things for years trying to build them. I just don't know how functional they'd be. They're so tall, they're so high in the air. One of them I could almost walk underneath it. Not that I'm a skyscraper, but I am 5'8 and 3 8 you know, and I could still darn near walk under it. I think the, the license plate was even with my head, and that's crazy. So I know it couldn't be a great driver going down the road, but fantastic looking rig. One of the rigs that I thought I'd bring attention to, because not everybody gets to go to the SEMA show, this is an example how crazy it is. There's a company that takes side-by-sides, like our little Polaris side-by-side, trick them out beyond recognition, put jet skis down where the wheels would go. So this thing's an actual wave runner, I guess you'd call it, I don't know what else. Puts out a million horsepower and it'd go a thousand miles an hour on the water. And all the time you're in a side-by-side. -side. It is, it's the wildest idea and this company's doing it. I thought, well, if somebody's building these, it'd be kind of fun, right? Let old Division Productions pay for me, have one of those. Wouldn't mind tooling around the uh, Dexter Lake, you know, and something like that. Well. Turns out it was a quarter million dollars. It was, it's definitely a big boy toy, but somebody's building them and somebody's buying them. Just another example of how crazy SEMA can be. One of the first stops I made after I got inside was a 72 Roadrunner. It looked like a 72 Roadrunner. I mean, it, it wasn't like done to the restoration quality that we do, but it, it was more like a driver quality. But I'm thinking, why would somebody pay so much money to get a driver quality 72 Roadrunner in here in a booth? Well, because it was all electric. This, this guy's a pretty smart cat. He went in there, gutted out all of the original drivetrain and suspension out of a 1972 Roadrunner, just like we would do, except we would put back in a Magnum Force and a Dana Rear End and a Hellcat and all those things. He went in there and put in a complete electric motor and charging system in this car from front to back. So when you see it going down the road, if you were to see it going down the road, you just think it's a regular Roadrunner. You don't realize it's 100% electric. And I guess he's selling the kits to be able to do this. I think it'd be a real cool thing someday maybe to have him do one for us. Maybe we do the body and paint on it and then send it down to him. I and mean, we are in a new world. I don't know how practical it would be, but it would be fun. 
How practical is an 807 horsepower 70 Challenger? Not real practical on the streets, can't do much with it. But this thing, I guess he drives it every single day. It's a daily driver for him. Another thing to make note of on that, and I meant to ask him, and I don't know that I ever got around to it, is on the Roadrunner, the rear suspension is modified. It looks almost like IndyCar stuff. It's, it's trick suspension front and rear. I just don't know if he did that because he needed the room for this powertrain or if he did it because he wanted it to handle. But overall, if you looked at that car from five feet away and stood back, you would see it's a 72 Roadrunner with a fully electric drivetrain in it. So the thing that'll hit you most when you get to the show is you've heard about it for the years, seen it in magazines, but until you walk in and you see the wildest of everything, the wildest side-by-sides, some of the wildest motorcycles are over there. Four-wheel drives, two-wheel drives, lowered, slammed, blown, naturally aspirated, custom cars, factory cars, one-off cars, prototypes. Everything that you can imagine is at that show, and you get to see it if you take the time to do it. There's four buildings now, and I only made it through three of them. I never made it over to the new West Hall that's across the road, but it was quite a show. There's a lot of hardware to look at in that little bit of time. So one of the things that I always like to do when I get to the show, on Monday if I have time, in this case I did, was swing by and see if Chip's around. I knew he had a little booth there and he was signing autographs, Chip Poussin. So I stopped by and I was looking at this rig that you'd walk by a hundred times yourself and you just think, I don't know, what is that, some old Ferrari Dino or something? I don't know the, the Euro Trash cars very well. This ain't no Euro Trash. This is a hand-built car. Everything's hand-built. So when you stand back and look at it, Every panel on that was formed from a big piece of flat aluminum. How do you do that? How do you have the ability to even do that? What kind of a craftsman can do stuff like that and make it look like it's factory? We could do it here. I could take a piece of aluminum, I could straighten it out, I could do body work over the top of it, paint it, and you'd never know. But there's no body and paint over the top of this. When you look at the panels, they're finished off. They have almost that DeLorean look, the scotch bright type of directional grain on it. There's nothing on that. It's all hand-formed, hand-built. The entire car was hand-formed and hand-built. And I guess Chip Foose was one of the designers. I'm sure he did more work than just design it. But that's the kind of car that you have to be watching for too. Don't just look for the big whistles and bells and the great big lights. Look for the cars like the Charger I mentioned, like this car, that have maybe 10,000 hours, I don't know. It's an endless amount of time to make perfect. Give them the appreciation they deserve. Don't just look at the 55 Chevy with a blower coming out of it because a lot of people can put something like that together, but only a handful of guys could build a car like that Roadster. One of the signings that we do every year is at the Classic Industries booth. Always enjoy seeing our friends there. We buy a lot of parts from these guys. They're nice, so we try to pay it forward and come by and sign autographs. Hello there. John Costanzo, Costanzia, <laughs> Seinfeld. <laughs> you hear that laughter? See, that's the difference. There's this natural. She laughs at everything. <laughs> We're sitting there at the booth enjoying everything. I'm not paying attention. All of a sudden, it's a lady I know from Twitter. Hey, look who it is. How, How are you, you doing, brother? I love your shirt, see? I know, right? It's the right shirt. I have to be embarrassing fans. I love it. I know. You see what shirt she's wearing? That's Lock me on off. there. We joke back and forth and stuff. We're taking pictures. My job in a picture is to make that person feel special. She comes in and usually you do a point at them, you know, they're here, you're here. She's a woman, she's a woman, right? Strange person right here, little TV world. Yeah, see, she, ow, oh, yeah. <laughs> bit my finger while I was hanging out there. Damn near drew blood right across there. I didn't even know what happened. I just know the look on Mark's face. Hey, she just bit my finger. I haven't seen anything. I'm just now finding out about this, that there's actual, it really did happen. This strange person right here, little TV world. Yeah, see, she, ow, oh, yeah. So I don't know. Sorry. That hurt. I didn't mean to bite. <laughs> Look, I wasn't there when the lady bit off the end of my dad's finger, but good for her. I'm sure he deserved it. Probably had that one coming. If you want to be on TV, just be, just, just say, hey, put it, put me in the show. Just say, hey, Mark, can you use this in an episode? I'm sure he'll do it. 
You don't need to go to that length. The funniest part of that is here I am trying to do good things, right? I'm, I'm trying to save the Amity Island, right? It's the 4th of July, we wanna have a barbecue and here come Jaws biting all off on my, my finger and stuff, man. You know, I am the victim. Dougie always says he's the victim. Some black curse over his head, you got no black curse. This is the warming curse, man. How much time you got? Hello, how are you? <laughs> How's the up? This was kind of cool. Courtney Hansen swung by the booth. You want to get a, a picture with me and an autograph? I thought that was really sweet. She didn't need me. You know, she's, she's got her own following and I know she's there doing signings all over the place. But I would just like to say that I thought she was really, really sweet. I teased her a little bit about wanting to take a run at the tray and she kind of played right back with me. Good. I'll just tell these guys that when you had that thing for me, you know, yeah, years ago when yeah. I first got started, how, uh, you know, I had, to, I had to let her down gently because, I mean, heck, I was married, and, you know. I, mean, <laughs> I, I, I was like, okay, you know. Uh, I mean, look who she was I, hanging out with back then. We're talking Chip Foose. Come on, man. I was almost offended, but then I understood. No, no, uh, I know, because you're that way. <laughs> you, you got a good heart. I've always said Courtney had a good heart. <laughs> oh, How are you doing? <laughs> That's just one of the fun things about the show is you get to meet other people and you realize that even though we're on TV and we're doing all these things, we're just the same as everybody else at home. We're just trying to enjoy our lives and we're trying to put something on TV that you can enjoy watching. So good for you, Courtney, you're, you're a fine lady. Can you guys crop this a little bit? I just, don't you put that camera down. Son of a <laughs> Great to see you. Good to see you too, Mark. It's wonderful, okay. I hate being short. <laughs>
it was absolutely fantastic to meet him. Great guy. Great shape. I think he's 80-something years old. I, yeah. The guy is in absolutely amazing shape. He's got perfect teeth, perfect hair, perfect everything. And that's what happens when you go fast. See, that's what I was saying earlier. Live fast, die old. He's lived fast, and he's still going in his 80s. Faster than death. <laughs> Stay tuned. With the convention finally coming to a close, Mark and the Ghouls reflect on the events leading up to the 2022 SEMA show. But will this breakneck build, the slammed convention schedule, and a graveyard full of cars in the queue awaiting his return home, drive this Mopar master to madness? Hold me close, a tiny dancer. Yeah, count the headlights on the highway. Or has the success of this one-of-a-kind 1970 Challenger TA with a massive V8 Hellcat Red Eye Crate Hemi make their trials worthwhile? Find out when Graveyard Cars returns. It's so popular here. People are here all day long admiring the car and asking about it. Mark and his team did such a beautiful job restoring this car. It just is really brings a lot of joy to us that all the people can see this car. Kudos to the graveyard team, the ghouls, and Mark Warman. What a beautiful job. You know, and when it comes to Wendell and his car being down there, especially for him being somewhat local. We see him a lot, we interact with him a lot. He's just a great guy. That car means the world to him. So for him to fly down to Vegas with his wife and see his car there and all the appreciation his car is getting, I know that's very rewarding for him and it's good for us to be able to give that to him. So it's probably the craziest thing I've ever done. I'm down at the SEMA show 2022 in the Mopar booth. Every year that we go to the show, I had thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool if we could just do a bit that we could feature in the show, not just me walking around saying things, but like, like if I were gonna introduce you to a car that I would normally do here in the showroom, I wanted to try to do it down there at the Mopar booth at SEMA, and everybody was very cooperative. They blocked it off for us to do. And it kind of struck me as I was in my motel room, what these cars mean to people. Now we can go over all the details on. This is the, by the way, the 71, Phoenix Cuda, the car that rose from the ashes, right? This was a 71 Hemi Cuda, numbers matching, one of 48 made, 426 Hemi automatic, B5 blue, black leather interior. And I gotta say, it's different when I'm in here and it's just you simpletons, not you, the fans, but my camera guys and audio. I don't care, right? I can do my thing, I can do my shtick, I can do this, I can show off. But when you got, you know, 50, 75, 100 people standing around listening to you, you're so much more conscientious. Being up on stage is totally different than being in here on stage. It's also a billboard car. I pulled it off, and, and uh, but I know that when I watched back through the edit, it wasn't nearly like I would have liked to done. I just wasn't in my element. They finally got the fish out of water. But this car was molten garbage, right? And now it's brought back to look like this. Now it's brought back to put smiles on people's faces like it did back in the day when it was new but also to remind us of our heritage, right? We have stuff over here that will show you what today's version of muscle when fused with yesterday's version looks like. And it really isn't about all the details because I'm a nerd and I could nerd out on it forever. It's more about, here's Graveyard Cars at the middle of the Mopar show at SEMA with one of our cars that we brought back from the dead. The thing about cars is they mean different things to different people. You got people who have classic cars, maybe they just got them, but they always wanted one since they were in high school, or it's a, you know, it's a dream. Then you have other people who have had them their whole lives and just want that connection to that family member. Even if they don't go out and drive it, they just want it in the garage and know that it's there and they could occasionally take it out. You also have people who just love them and drive them like crazy, like Jim DeLucci with 72 Dust or Kimberly Cook with 70 Barracuda, and the Hills, I mean, you have all different kinds of people, all different walks of life that love these cars for a multitude of reasons. So it's just like the Mopars, we're all a little different. Or here, we have what happens when you throw an 807 horsepower Mopar crate engine in a 1970 Dodge Challenger TA. So the TA Challenger that you see, 
We took, a, a again, an 807 horsepower crate engine. We married it together with an American powertrain five-speed transmission, a Dana 60 in the back. And when you look under the hood of this car, you would think that that engine started life in that car. Because we took all the necessary steps that we would to restore Wendell's 71 Hemi Cuda, we applied that same technology and that same passion in making this car appear as though if you could go back in time and build one, that's what it would look like. All in all, you know, it's an overview of this year's SEMA. I couldn't be more proud. The build was amazing. It went just as we thought it would go, and it actually was executed that way. It was done on time, and not just done on time, it was detailed out, it was just ready to go. Josh did a phenomenal job on the car, having Wendell's car there, having Heather and Layla down there, so we snuck Layla in until they threw her out. Who throws, yeah, Seema. Who throws a two-year-old out dressed up like a dinosaur? Seema does. That was great having my family there and the fact that we still kept work going here at the shop. And Mark even rewarded a few of our guys, which he doesn't probably get enough credit for. So a lot of the guys that really were heavy in the, the build of the car, he brought them also. So it was a total, total good team building, great car, family, get in, do some autographs, take some pictures, get home and get back to work. So I just wanted to take a minute in this SEMA show and say, you know, thank you to everybody that's here, but thank you to you at home that have put Mark Warman and Graveyard Cars on the map in a position where we have this global recognition. Look, all jokes aside, this is a huge thing for my dad. I know he really does love going to SEMA. Like, this is his dream. This is all he ever worked for. Go and build cars and display them in the SEMA booth. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. So I'm looking forward to next year when I can go down there with my mom. Everybody talks about my passion, but my passion comes from my love. Driving back from the show is always a great time to reflect. And as I look back at the 2022 show, it, it was a hit for us. Everybody got in there, we teamed together, we had fun at the booths. Nobody went out and got drunk and hammered and created embarrassing moments for me. That's a good thing. We, we grow, even the young ones grow. But the cars were amazing, the people were amazing, the chicks were all over me and, you know, is what it is, right? I mean, you get used to it. I know Tom Cruise goes through this a lot at a premiere, that the chicks will come going all bananas. It's kind of, it was kind of like, for me, it was like the Beatles. Remember the Beatles and the, and the girls would be in the front row and all throwing up their garments and stuff like that. It wasn't exactly like that for me. Frankly, it was nothing like that for me. Um, <laughs> And I guess at the end of the day, I am honored to be at the Mopar booth 2022, showing off two of the finest cars we've ever restored. So this would be a good button for the episode, by the way. You know how you fade out on me and, and the music comes in and then they say um, that Green Day song, right? What one's that? Closing time. Uh, huh? Closing time. Closing time? Closing time? I've never heard that song, Tiny. Well, sing me another one. What else would it be? Oh, my clothes are tiny dancer. I used to like that song. Not a fan anymore. Yeah. Count the headlights on the highway. That kind of fade out. You just keep on me. Don't, don't, don't stay on me. Let me walk out of, yeah. Lay me down and she's a little, yeah. Just like that. You're following me. This is the problem, Tiny.